The Belagarth Book of War. Written by the War Council. Narrated by Kudzu. Tribe of Broken Nose. Long Tooth of Horde. Dringer of Thursas. Piss Drowner of Big Blood Burb. Arch Haringer of Rome and of Pentwavern. Witness of the Avatar. Incarnate of Reki. Thing Servant. Infatigable. Cadine of Goblins. The Belagarth Book of War. Part 1. Safety and Adjudication 1.0 Each individual is expected to treat each other with respect and participate in fair play, with safety and sportsmanship in mind. Actual violence, threats of actual violence, cheating and arguing with marshals or other combatants disrespectfully are just a few examples of unacceptable behavior and are not allowed. 1.1 Marshals Marshals are the referees of Belgarth, responsible for rules enforcement, encouraging acceptable behavior, and the inspection of both the failed and the equipment used. 1.1.1 A marshal has the authority to remove anyone from the field of battle for reasons listed in Rule 1.0. 1.1.2 Marshals may call hit determinations at their discretion. 1.1.3 Marshals oversee the safe conduct of battles and therefore have the power to declare HOLD whenever a safety concern arises. 1.1.4 Marshals enforce the rules enumerated in Section 4, Weapon Specifications and Checking, and determine the classifications of equipment. 1.1.5 Marshals shall not be used in such a way as to gain protection or advantage in the combat. 1.1.6 Solid Yellow Tabards, Baldricks, or other pieces of solid yellow garb signify that a person is a marshal or a non-combatant. Combatants are forbidden from wearing such. 1.1.7 Non-combatants on the field must be approved by a marshal. 1.1.8 Intentional illegal acts may result in immediate removal from the field until a marshal allows them re-entry. Marshals are the arbiter of intent. 1.1.9 Unintentional illegal acts that reoccur frequently shall be treated as intentional. 1.2 Hold! In the event of an unsafe situation, anybody present must call Hold! as loudly as possible. All activity must cease while a marshal assesses the situation. The battle will resume when the marshal calls POSITIONS to prepare combatants for resuming and then LAY ON! 1.2.1 Combatants must drop to a knee immediately when a hold is called and yell HOLD as well. They should not move or re-equip during a hold unless told to do so by a marshal. 1.2.2 It is illegal to call a hold or use a hold called by someone else to gain an advantage over fellow combatants. 1.2.3 Combatants must avoid using phrases such as hold the line or any words that could be misinterpreted as hold during a battle. 1.3. All equipment must be inspected and properly marked according to the guidelines outlined in Section 4.4 before it is used in combat. 1.4. The target of an attack has the authority to make combat hit determinations, but must defer to the discretion of marshals. 1.5. Creative interpretation of the rules to gain any advantage is illegal. The marshal settles all disputes. 1.6 Fighting near weapon piles, onlookers 
or unsafe locations is discouraged. 1.7. A combatant may choose to call themselves dead and or leave the field at any time by displaying death in an appropriate manner. See Rule 3.7.3.4. 1.7.1. Combatants may not re-enter the field until gameplay has ceased, or a marshal has allowed re-entry. This must be done in a safe manner to get clear of the battlefield boundaries and should not interfere with the ongoing battle. Part 2. Equipment Classifications and Definitions 2.1. There are five classifications of offensive equipment, hereafter called Weapons. Weapons are any item that can score combat hits. All weapons must meet the requirements outlined in Section 4, Weapon Specifications and Checking. 2.1.1. Class 1. One-handed swung weapon. 2.1.2. Class 2. Two-handed swung weapon. 2.1.3. Class 3. Thrusting weapon. 2.1.4. Class 4. Missile weapon. 2.1.5. Class 5. Head only missile weapon. 2.2. Defensive equipment is any item that gives combat advantage to its wielder by preventing combat hits and is unable to inflict damage on combatants. 2.2.1. There are two types of defensive equipment. Shields and the armor. All defensive equipment must meet the requirements outlined in section 4.11 and 4.12, respectively. 2.2.2 Shields are rigid objects that are padded on the front and sides and are equipped with handles or straps. 2.2.3 A shield may not be constructed in a manner that would confer the advantage of unbreakable armor. 2.2.3.1 Unbreakable armor is defined as a worn shield that shapes slash forms closely to more than one target area, wraps around a limb unreasonably, and or shapes slash forms closely to multiple planes of the torsobo. 2.2.4 Armor is protective body covering, consisting of Period materials. Armor must be readily recognizable as armor. 2.3. No single piece of equipment can be classified as both offensive and defensive equipment. For example, a weapon cannot also serve as a shield or armor. 2.4. Miscellaneous equipment includes, but is not limited to, items such as thin belts, pouches, boots, quivers, straps, scabbards, and non-armor clothing and headwear. 2.4.1 While conferring no special rules advantage, miscellaneous equipment may be checked for combat safety and Belgarth appropriate appearance at the marshal's discretion. The minimum non-armor clothing requirements are outlined in Section 5, Garb. 2.4.2 Miscellaneous equipment cannot serve as offensive or defensive equipment, regardless of the materials used. Part 3. Combat. 3.1. The following actions are allowable contact. 3.1.1. Weapon-to-weapon contact. 3.1.2. Weapon-to-body contact is allowed on valid target areas using striking legal surfaces. 3.1.3 Body-to-weapon contact, pushing, grabbing, or sweeping a combatant's strike legal surface results in a valid hit to the body location used for contact. Additional rules may be found in 3.12. 3.1.4 Weapon-to-shield contact is allowed. 3.1.5 Shield to weapon contact. Shields may be used to strike, deflect, move, or pin a combatant's weapon. 3.1.6 Shield to shield contact. 
Shields may be used to strike, deflect, move, or pin a combatant's shield. 3.1.7 Shield to body contact. Shields may be used to strike, deflect, move, or pin a combatant's body other than what is mentioned in 3.2. 3.1.8 Body to shield contact. Combatants may manipulate another combatant's shield with their body, including feet, knees, shoulders, hands, and elbows. 3.1.9 Body to body contact. Combatants may make contact with other combatants in accordance to Rule 3.12. 3.2 Disallowed contact. 3.2.1 Head contact from class 1, 2, and 3 weapons or shields. 3.2.1.1 Feints toward the head from class 1, 2, or 3 weapons or shields are discouraged. 3.2.2 Unarmed punches and kicks directed at other combatants' bodies. 3.2.3 Throws, where the throwing combatant allows the other combatant to free fall to the ground. 3.2.4 Intentionally hitting another combatant with a non-striking surface. 3.2.5 Joint slash nerve holds or manipulations. 3.2.6 Grappling the head or neck. 3.3 Target area definition. Hits. 3.3.1 Body. Area bounded by the base of neck. Inclusive. Shoulder arm joint. Inclusive. Hip leg socket. Inclusive. Groin and buttocks. Inclusive. 3.3.2 Arms. Area bounded by the wrist. Inclusive. And the shoulder arm joint. Exclusive. 3.3.3 Legs. Area bounded by the ankle. Inclusive. And hip leg socket. Exclusive. 3.3.4 Head. Area above the base of neck. Exclusive. 3.3.5 Hands. Area below the wrist. Exclusive. An empty hand is a legal target area. A hand on a weapon or shield is considered part of that weapon or shield. And a hit to the hand is considered a hit to the arm. 3.3.6 Feet Area below the ankle. Exclusive. A foot is a legal target area if it is off the ground. Any hit to the foot is considered a hit to the leg. 3.4. Weapons. 3.4.1. Weapons which strike with sufficient force can score a hit to the target area. 3.4.2. Sufficient force is defined as being both solid and having powerful impact on a target area as defined below. 3.4.2.1. Solid. Successfully strikes the target area. Taps, grazes, significantly obstructed strikes, and strikes that come in contact with garb only do not count as sufficient force. 3.4.2.2 Strikes that do not have sufficient force shall be communicated as insufficient by saying light, graze, or garb as appropriate. 3.5 Weapon damage. Weapons yield various amounts of damage according to the classification of the weapon and the armor slash damage status of the target. 3.5.1 Class 1. One-handed swung weapons. These weapons cause one hit to the target area. And a Class 1 or Class 2 weapon swung with one hand, no matter the length, is a Class 1 weapon. Class 1 weapons swung with two hands causes one hit to the target area. 
3.5.2 Class 2 Two-handed swung weapons cause two hits to the target area when used for two-handed strikes. 3.5.2.1 Two-handed is defined as having both hands fixed on the weapon when the weapon makes contact with the target. 3.5.2.2 Combatants striking with a two-handed swing should call two as they strike. 3.5.3 Class 3. Thrusting weapons, wielded one-handed, cause one hit of damage to an unarmored target area and have no effect against an armored area. 3.5.3.1. When used two-handed, Class 3 weapons bypass armor. 3.5.3.2. Combatants striking with a two-handed stab should call double as they strike. C3.5.2.1 for two-handed definition. 3.5.4. Class 4 missile weapons cause one hit to a target area and bypass all armor except head armor. A class 4 missile weapon striking an armored portion of the head area causes no hit. 3.5.5. Class 5. Head-only missile weapons cause one hit to an unarmored head area. A Class 5 weapon striking an armored portion of the head area causes no hit. 3.5.6 The head is a legal target area for arrows slash bolts, thrown javelins, and all Class 5 weapons. 3.5.6.1 The head is an illegal target area for Class 1 two, and three weapons. 3.5.7 A class one or class two weapon cannot also be a class four or five weapon. 3.5.8 Intentionally hitting combatants with a non-striking surface of a weapon is illegal. For example, deliberately striking a combatant with flail haft padding to allow the head to swing around and hit a target area. 3.5.9 Anviling is blocking a weapon strike by laying a weapon against a target area and or shield and is illegal. 3.5.9.1 Sufficient force hits must be taken through anviling weapons. 3.5.9.2 Hits must be taken from weapons not in direct contact with a target area or shield but are driven into a target area or shield with sufficient force. 3.5.10 Sheathed or otherwise worn weapons cannot block attacks. 3.5.11 Shot in motion. An attack on another combatant that begins before the attacker is hit by a legal blow is considered a legal shot on the combatant. The shot may not change planes once the attacker is hit. For example, a fake on the combatant. 3.5.12 Magic Switch It is permissible to move a weapon or shield from the disabled hand to the uninjured hand immediately after a combatant's arm is hit. 3.6 Armor 3.6.1 Armor confers one additional hit to the target area covered by the armor. Multiple pieces of armor on the same target area only confer a single hit. A single piece of armor covering multiple areas confer a hit on each target area covered. 3.6.2 Armor only protects areas covered. 3.6.3 Armor must cover at least one-third of a target area. Armor which extends continuously from a different target area is not required to cover one-third of a target area to count as armor for that target area. 3.6.4 Weapons that strike both armored and unarmored target areas are considered to have hit the unarmored target area. 3.6.5 the presence of armor must be easily discernible to count as armor. 3.6.6 Armor must be declared to acknowledge that a sufficient force strike hit the armor, but
but did not disable a target area. 3.6.6.1 It is encouraged to include the target area in the Declaration of Armor. For example, Left Leg Armor! Or Body Armor! 3.7 Hits 3.7.1 All hits and armor status effects must be accurately portrayed at all times and truthfully reported when asked. 3.7.2 Effects of Hits 3.7.2.1 One hit to an unarmored target area disables that target area. 3.7.2.2 Two hits to an armored target area disable that target area. 3.7.2.3 Disabled arm A disabled arm may not hold anything. If the arm is hit by a class 1 or 2 weapon, the arm must be placed behind the back. If the arm is hit by a class 3 or 4 weapon, leave the arm dangling limply. 3.7.2.4 Disabled leg Kneel on ground with the non-disabled leg up. When hit, the combatant must immediately drop to the disabled knee. 3.7.2.4.1 A combatant who has their leg disabled must either crawl on their knees or be clearly supported by others when moving. 3.7.2.4.2 A disabled leg may not be used to power movement, but a combatant may move in any way that they are capable of moving without power from the disabled leg. 3.7.2.4.3 if a combatant has both knees on the ground, or both knees in the air, a strike to either leg is considered to have hit the good leg. 3.7.2.4.4 It is illegal to change your disabled leg, unless a medical condition requires you to do so. 3.7.2.4.5 Combatants must verbally distinguish between a leg disabled by a class 1 or 2 weapon or a leg disabled by a class 3 or 4 weapon. 3.7.2.4.6 A leg disabled by a class 3 or 4 weapon should kneel on ground with the non-disabled leg up, but a hit to a hacked leg does not cause damage to the leg damaged by the class 3 or 4 weapon. This is an exemption to Rule 3.7.2.4.3. 3.7.2.5 A disabled body causes death. 3.7.2.6 A disabled head causes death. 3.7.2.7 Two disabled limb target areas, arms and or legs, cause death. 3.7.2.7.1 Limbs entered with class 3 or class 4 weapons do not count towards this total. 3.7.3 Death Combatants must lay down immediately! Combatants are only allowed to move if instructed by a marshal or in order to move away from a potentially unsafe situation. And cuts are just going to read this one again. Not even going to edit this part out because this one actually cuts your favorite role. It's 3.7.3. It's the death roll. And you people not following, no, so no, no, cuts are going to read it again. again. Don't care what you no, say. No, my lord. Shut up! Shut up, producer! My, my lord, no, you don't get, have get to out of the book! No, you, sh you shut up! D don't yell, please, sir. No, I don't care. Don't care. Going to I'm read death roll again. Shut up! Get, get out of here. No, just sir. Just shut up. Please. No. I no, going to read it again. To do my job. You get out of here right now. I just have to do Stupid thing. Knobs, no, you shut up, you stupid. It's get out of here. Say, sir. <clears throat> sir, please, I'm just 3. trying to do my job. Three point seven point three. Just need to turn the dials. Combatants and keep must along. lay down but, immediately. But the budget is the Combatants are the only one, allowed to I, move if instructed just, by a marshal, if you, or in order please, to sir, move away lord, from a potentially unsafe I'm situation. Not, I must have you move on, please, sir. No. Combatants. I, I, I just, Lay down immediately. Only allowed to move away if instructed by a marshal.
or in order to move away from potentially unsafe situation. You're supposed to lay down. You're supposed to lay down. Hey, next time, next time you die, lay down on the ground and don't move. Okay, and don't talk either because you're dead. 3.7.3.1 Attempting to gain a combat advantage over living players by appearing dead or declaring death and then returning to play is illegal. For example, sitting down, appearing to look dead, and waiting for someone to draw near. 3.7.3.2 Combatants cannot return to life or otherwise undo a bad call unless otherwise specified by a marshal to do so. 3.7.3.3 Combatants may communicate late when their hit lands after their death, nullifying the damage from the strike to the other combatants. 3.7.3.4 A combatant may indicate that they are dead by placing a weapon or arm on their head and loudly calling, DEAD! This is only allowed when dead combatants are attempting to exit the field as instructed to by a marshal or to call themselves dead, as in Rule 1.7. 3.7.3.5 Dropping weapons is not a valid show of death. 3.7.3.6 If a combatant is dead, they must look dead, and to make it clear to those around them that they are dead. For example, placing an elbow on the ground while lying down. 3.7.3.7 Dead combatants must not talk to the living unless to indicate a potential safety hazard. 3.7.4 Combatants attacking an unaware combatant with a Class 2 or Class 3 weapon must shout TWO with a two-handed Class 2 swing, SINGLE with a one-handed Class 3 shot, and DOUBLE if with two-handed Class 3 attack as appropriate. If the weapon class is not called, the combatant should consider a successful strike to cause a single hit. 3.7.5 Subsequent hits to the same location. 3.7.5.1 All subsequent hits with Class 3 or Class 4 weapon on the same target area, previously injured only by a Class 3 or 4 weapon, are ignored. 3.7.5.2 all subsequent hits to an arm, disabled by a Class 1 or 2 weapon, pass through to the body. However, armor still provides its protective benefits in the case of subsequent hits. For example, if a combatant has an arm disabled, but is wearing torso armor, a subsequent Class 1 hit to the arm would first count against the armor, and the following hit would be to the body. 3.7.5.3 All subsequent hits to a leg disabled by a Class 1 or 2 weapon during the initial movement of the knee to the ground constitute death. Once the knee is on the ground, subsequent shots to the disabled leg are ignored. 3.7.5.4 A target area disabled by a Class 3 or Class 4 weapon that is subsequently hit by a Class 1 or Class 2 weapon is then considered to be disabled by a Class 1 or Class 2 weapon. 3.8 A hit that strikes both the body and either an arm or a leg is assumed to have hit the body. 3.9 A single strike can only damage one target area. 3.10 Shields 3.10.1 Shields are destroyed by two heavy, solid, two-handed strikes from a Class 2 weapon. 3.10.1.1 Subsequent strikes to a destroyed shield continue into the target area on which the shield is worn. For example, if a shield on an arm is broken by two sufficient Class 2 hits and is not dropped, the next hit would be to the arm, and after that, to the body. 3.10.2 Heavy strikes are defined as a stronger-than-normal strike, as defined in 3.4.2 and 3.5.2.1. 3.10.3 Shields may be used in any reasonable manner and still be considered a shield. 3.10.4 
only one shield may be used by a combatant at a time. 3.10.5 The wielder of the shield determines if a shield-breaking hit is sufficient. 3.10.6 Shields lying on the ground cannot be broken. 3.11 Offensive shield techniques. 3.11.1 It is illegal to use offensive shield techniques to move combatants into hazards or obstacles such as trees or paved surfaces. 3.11.2 It is illegal to use the unpadded portions of the shield for offensive shield techniques. 3.11.3 Intentional shield contact to the head or neck is illegal. 3.11.4 Shield bashing and checking. 3.11.4.1 Shield bashing is defined as a combatant charging another combatant and using the face or edge of their shield to make contact with their shield or body, such that forward momentum is impossible to stop within two steps. 3.11.4.2 Shield checking is defined as a combatant using the face or edge of their shield to make contact with another combatant while stationary or charging from two steps away or less, such that the combatant is able to stop their forward momentum within two steps. 3.11.4.3 It is legal to shield bash or check another combatant from the front or the sides, excluding the rear quadrant. The combatant initiating the bash or check must ensure that this will not place another combatant in an unsafe situation. 3.11.4.4 A combatant may bash another combatant who does not have a shield. 3.11.4.5 while performing a shield bash or check, a combatant may not make intentional contact with another combatant's head or neck. 3.11.4.6 Bashes must target a combatant's center of mass, not knees or legs. 3.11.4.7 It is illegal to bash or check combatants that have bows and or arrows or bolts especially Gecko. 3.11.5 Shield braces, edging, and bumping. 3.11.5.1 A shield brace is when a combatant plants their feet while holding or placing their shield in front of a moving combatant. 3.11.5.2 A shield bump is incidental shield contact against a combatant's body or equipment when the intent is not to knock the combatant over. 3.11.5.3 Edging is using the edge of a shield against a combatant's shield, body, or weapons. 3.11.5.4 Shield braces and bumps are legal from all four sides against other combatants. 3.11.5.5 It is illegal to intentionally edge a combatant's head or neck. 3.11.5.6 Edging is legal from the front and both sides, but not from the rear. 3.11.6 Shield kicking. 3.11.6.1 Shield kicking is when a combatant makes contact with another combatant's shield with their foot. 3.11.6.2 Kicking is allowed only to shields, not to people. The kicker must maintain sufficient control to not kick another combatant. 3.11.6.3 Kicking of shields less than 18 inches diameter is illegal. 3.11.6.4 A shield kicker must maintain one foot on the ground. Kicks where both feet leave the ground are illegal. 3.11.6.5 Shield kicking from the rear is illegal. 3.12 Grappling 3.12.1 Grappling is allowed. 3.12.2 Grappling is defined as wrestling or attempting to grasp another combatant's body to prevent attacks or to control the combatant's movements. 3.12.3 
grasping the non-striking surfaces of another combatant's weapon, such as the haft of a flail or a spear shaft, does not constitute a grapple. 3.12.4. Combatants may initiate grapples with other combatants according to the following rules. 3.12.4.1. A combatant wearing no armor may grapple all combatants. 3.12.4.2. A combatant wearing leather, or mostly, two-thirds or more, leather composite armor, may grapple any armored combatant, but not unarmored combatants. 3.12.4.3 A combatant wearing chain armor, or mostly, two-thirds or more, metal composite armor, may grapple combatants wearing mostly metal composite, chain, or plate armor. 3.12.4.4 a combatant wearing plate armor may not initiate a grapple. 3.12.4.5 A combatant wearing plastic safety equipment is treated as leather armor for grappling purposes only. 3.12.4.6 Groin protection is exempt from 3.12.4.5 3.12.5 A grappler must maintain positive control of the combatant when attempting to bring a grappled combatant to the ground. 3.12.5.1 Positive control is defined as a grappler bearing some of a combatant's weight and speed when bringing them to the ground. 3.12.6 Combatants with bows and or arrows, or bolts, may not initiate grapples or be grappled. 3.12.6.1 Combatants may not grasp a combatant's bow or arrows slash bolts with the intent to control their direction or prevent them from using this equipment. 3.12.7 Combatants may grab their weapons any way they wish, including the blade slash striking surface. This is an exemption to the anviling rule. 3.5.9 3.12.8 Gripping the striking surface of a combatant's weapon results in the disabling of that limb. 3.12.9 Contested weapons, meaning weapons being held by two or more combatants vying for control, may not be held by the striking surfaces. A combatant who grabs the striking surface of a contested weapon must lose that limb. 3.13. Missile Weapon Conventions 3.13.1. If a bow or crossbow is hit by a Class 1 or 2 weapon, it is considered broken and cannot be used for the remainder of the battle. 3.13.2 A half-draw or throw for Class 4 weapons under a range of 20 feet is required. 3.13.2.1 Half-draw is defined as drawing back the bow only so far, such that it imparts no more than half the force to the arrow than a normal full draw. This distance and pull will vary due to variances in bow design. 3.13.2.2 Half throw is defined as drawing back the javelin only so far, such that it imparts no more than half the force of a normal full throw. 3.13.3 A missile weapon must travel its entire length to score a hit. 3.13.4 An arrow must be fired from a bow in order to score a combat hit. Similarly, a bolt must be fired from a crossbow in order to score a combat hit. 3.13.5 A missile weapon is considered to have hit if there is significant deflection of the missile head, greater than 30 degrees. Once the missile head has significantly deflected, the missile is rendered harmless until retrieved and fired again. 3.13.6 an archer who attacks with an arrow or a bolt may call a combat hit for clarification when the shot clearly and unambiguously hit a target area. 3.13.6.1 For a shot to be clear and unambiguous, the archer must have an unobstructed view of the entire flight of the arrow or bolt, including post-hit deflection. 3.13.7 a javelin thrower may clarify that the javelin did not hit with the point by declaring shaft or saying that the shot was not good. 3.13.8 Javelin throwers may call point for clarification. 3.13.9 When in doubt, 
the target makes the hit determination for missile weapons. 3.13.10. Blocking missiles. 3.13.10.1. All rocks and javelins may be blocked by any means that keeps the missile away from a target area. 3.13.10.2. An arrow or bolt may only be blocked by a shield. An arrow or bolt blocked by a weapon is considered to have continued to travel in the same direction and strike the target area immediately behind the weapon. 3.13.10.3 Intentional blocking of an arrow or bolt with anything but a shield causes death to the blocker. This includes attempting to swat arrows or bolts out of the air using weapons or limbs. Part 4 Weapon Specifications and Checking 4.1 Definitions 4.1.1 Striking Surface Padded surface of a weapon designed to make contact with a combatant during combat. Only the striking surface of a weapon may score a hit. 4.1.2 Non-Striking Surface Any padded surface of the weapon that is not a striking surface. 4.1.2.1 Incidental Padding The padded part of a weapon that could make direct contact with a combatant during a swing, but cannot score a hit. 4.1.2.2 Courtesy Padding The padded part of a weapon that might make contact with a combatant during combat, but is unlikely to do so in the direction of the swing. For example, the haft padding for a spear, or just above a flail's handle. 4.1.3 Handle Non-padded portion of the weapon designed as a handhold 4.1.4 Pommel Non-striking surface that covers the end of the handle 4.1.5 Cross guard Non-striking surface that separates the striking surface from the handle and is perpendicular to the striking section of the weapon 4.1.6 Hilt the combination of the handle, pommel, and crossguard. 4.1.7 Core The center of the weapon used to provide rigidity and flexibility to the striking and non-striking surfaces attached to it. 4.1.8 Sword Any weapon approximating a medieval sword, constructed using either an edge-slash-flat or cylindrical design. 4.1.9 Flail, any hinged weapon. 4.1.10, double-ended weapon, a weapon approximating a medieval staff. 4.1.11, javelin, when thrown, a class 4 weapon, when used to stab, a class 3 weapon. 4.1.12, archery, class 4 weapons including bows, crossbows, arrows, and bolts. 4.1.13, rocks, class 5 weapons. 4.2, padding and cover requirements. 4.2.1, padding on the striking surface must have sufficient cushioning to prevent the core from being felt during a full force hit. 4.2.1.1, padding on the striking surface must have sufficient cushioning to prevent excessive stigging or bruising during a full force swing. 4.2.1.2 All striking surfaces must be covered by cloth. The cloth covering must be in good condition with no serious rips or holes, especially near the tip of a weapon. 4.2.1.3 Cloth grip tape is not an allowable substitute for covering striking surfaces. 4.2.2 Incidental padding is required on those parts of a weapon that are likely to come into contact with a combatant during normal combat, but are not striking surfaces. 4.2.2.1 Incidental padding must be sufficiently cushioning as to prevent the core from being felt during a sufficient force shot. 4.2.2.2 Incidental padding is not required to be as soft as striking surface padding. 4.2.2.3 Incidental padding must be covered by cloth, tape, or plasti-dip. 4.2.3 
Courtesy padding may be used in any situation where padding is required, but it is unlikely that the weapon will contact a combatant. 4.2.3.1 Courtesy padding must have sufficient cushioning to provide some protection in the event of contact. 4.2.3.2 Courtesy padding must be covered by cloth, tape, or plastidip. 4.2.4 Half dead A weapon is half dead if the striking surface does not extend all the way to the handle. 4.2.4.1 Hafted Class 1 weapons must have incidental padding that extends at least 6 inches, 15.24 centimeters, from the striking surface or to the handle, whichever is shorter, and courtesy padding that extends from the bottom of the incidental padding to the handle. 4.2.4.2 Two-handed hafted Class 2 only and Class 2 slash Class 3 combined weapons must have incidental padding that extends at least 12 inches, 30.48 centimeters from the striking surface or to the handle, whichever is shorter, and courtesy padding that extends from the bottom of the incidental padding to the handle. 4.2.5 Handles must be contiguous. It is not allowable to have a handle, courtesy padding, and then an additional unpadded handle closer to the striking surfaces. 4.2.6 the only exception to this rule are double-ended weapons with specifications that conform to 4.9.6. 4.3. Tape may be used on striking surfaces under the cloth covering. However, the tape may not cause the weapon to hit too hard as determined by a hit test. 4.4. Marking. Weapons must be marked with appropriate colors of tape to denote their classifications. This marking tape must be placed in a manner so that combatants and marshals may easily see it. Unmarked weapons will only be checked as Class 1 weapons. 4.4.1 Class 1 weapons are marked with blue tape on either the pommel or handle. 4.4.2 Class 2 weapons are marked with red tape on either the pommel or handle. 4.4.3 Class 3 weapons are marked with green tape on either the pommel or handle. 4.4.3.1 Class 1 and 2 weapons that are also Class 3 are marked in the same way. 4.4.4 Class 4 and 5 weapons are marked in a manner to indicate a marshal has inspected them. 4.5 Template Rules 4.5.1 Two and a half inch rule 6.35 centimeters. No surface on a striking edge, sword tip, arrow, bolt head, spear head, javelin head, etc., whether designed for stabbing or not, may readily pass more than one half inch, 1.3 centimeters, through a two and one half inch, 6.35 centimeters, hole. 4.5.1.1. The weapon tip is exempt from the two and one half inch, 6.35 cm rule, rule 4.5.1, if the weapon has a semicircular tip with a minimum 1 and 1 half inch, 3.81 cm radius. 4.5.2 Weapon pommels and other protrusions, such as the ends of cross guards, may not readily pass more than 1 half inch, 1.3 cm, through a 2 inch, 5.08 cm diameter hole. 4.6. The maximum allowed flex of any weapon except javelins is 45 degrees. 4.6.1. Arrows, bolts, bows, crossbows, and class 5 weapons are exempt from flex rules. 4.7. All areas of wood court weapons must be taped, including bamboo and rattan. 4.7.1. Weapon handles and wooden bows are not required to be taped. 4.7.2 Wooden arrow slash bolt shafts must be wrapped completely in tape prior to building the arrowhead. 4.8 Other than aluminum arrow slash bolt shafts, a weapon may not have a metal core. 4.9 All weapons must be built to the following specifications. 4.9.1 
Class 1. All Class 1 weapons must conform to the following as applicable. 4.9.1.1 A Class 1 weapon under 24 inches, 60.96 centimeters in length, has no weight minimum. 4.9.1.2 A Class 1 weapon 24 inches, 60.96 centimeters in length or longer, must weigh a minimum of 12 ounces. 340.2 grams. 4.9.1.3 With the exception of double-ended weapons, a Class 1 weapon must be shorter than 48 inches, 121.92 centimeters. 4.9.1.4 The maximum handle length for a Class 1 weapon is 12 inches, 30.5 centimeters, or one-third of the overall length, whichever is greater. This cannot exceed one half of the overall length. 4.9.1.5 The minimum overall length of a class 1 is 12 inches, 30.5 centimeters, of contiguous striking, incidental, and courtesy padding, plus the length of the hilt. 4.9.1.6 A class 1 weapon may also be class 3. 4.9.2 Class 2 all Class II weapons must conform to the following. 4.9.2.1 The minimum length is 48 inches, 121.92 centimeters. 4.9.2.2 The minimum weight is 24 ounces, 680.4 grams. 4.9.2.3 The maximum handle length for Class II weapons is 18 inches, 45.72 centimeters, or one-third of the overall length, whichever is greater. This cannot exceed one-half of the overall length. 4.9.2.4 A Class 2 weapon may also be a Class 3. 4.9.3 Class 3 All Class 3 weapons must conform to the following. 4.9.3.1 if the weapon is Class 3 only, it has no weight restriction. 4.9.3.2 The maximum handle length for Class 3 weapons is two-thirds of the overall length. 4.9.3.3 If the weapon is Class 3 only, it may not have a yellow cover. 4.9.4 Single-edged weapons must have their non-striking edge clearly marked for at least 12 inches, 30.5 centimeters, with tape, paint, fabric, or other material in a way that contrasts with the striking surface cover and does not wrap onto the flat of the blade. 4.9.5 Flails must conform to the following. 4.9.5.1 The striking surface must have a minimum circumference of 15 inches, 38.1 centimeters, Measured on the two narrowest axes. 4.9.5.2 Only the head of a flail is a striking surface. 4.9.5.3 The maximum chain, or hinge, connecting the striking surface to the hilt is 6 inches, 15.24 centimeters. 4.9.5.4 Only one hinge per flail is allowed. 4.9.5.5 The hinged part of the flail must be padded with foam, often referred to as dingleberries, to keep the chain from easily entangling a weapon or body part. No more than one and one-half inches, 3.81 centimeters of chain, may be exposed. 4.9.5.6 The maximum overall length is 40 inches, 101.6 centimeters. 4.9.5.7 Flails must contain incidental padding for at least 6 inches, 15.24 centimeters of the haft before the chain. 4.9.6 Double-ended weapons must conform to all of the following. 4.9.6.1 Double-ended weapons must not be more than 7 feet long, 2.13 meters. 4.9.6.2 Double-ended weapons must have a minimum of 18 inches, 
45.72 centimeters in length of striking surface, covering each end in a cylindrical fashion. Both striking surfaces of this weapon must follow Class Three weapon standards for a double-ended weapon to be legal. 4.9.6.3 Regardless of length, a double-ended weapon is a Class One weapon when swung and Class Three when thrust. 4.9.6.4 Double-ended weapons may have no more than one-third its overall length as unpadded handle. 4.9.7 Javelins must conform to all of the following. 4.9.7.1 Must also pass as a Class 3 weapon. 4.9.7.2 The maximum weight is 16 ounces, 453.6 grams. 4.9.7.3 The minimum length is 4 feet, 1.22 meters. 4.9.7.4 The maximum length is 7 feet, 2.13 meters. 4.9.7.5 Must have courtesy padding along the entire length. 4.9.7.6 Must flex less than 90 degrees. This is an exception to Rule 4.6. 4.9.7.7 Must have a yellow cover on the striking surface of the weapon. 4.9.8 Archery Restrictions 4.9.8.1 Arrows and bolts must conform to the stated arrow construction requirements and are exempt from non-arrow weapon construction requirements. 4.9.8.1.1 Crossbow bolts must be able to be fired by a standard bow and will be tested as normal arrows during arrow check. 4.9.8.2 Compound bows or compound crossbows are not allowed. 4.9.8.3 Bows may not have any dangerous protrusions, such as metal post arrow rests or... Mechanical modifications such as sights, stabilizers, or releases. 4.9.8.4 The maximum poundage allowed on a bow is 35 pounds, 15.88 kilograms, pull at 28 inches, 71.12 centimeters, of draw. 4.9.8.5 A crossbow's draw may not exceed 450 inch pounds, or 518.5 kilogram force centimeters. 4.9.8.5.1 Inch pounds are calculated by multiplying poundage by power stroke. 4.9.8.5.1.1 Poundage is measured at the bow's full draw. 4.9.8.5.1.2 Power stroke is the distance from rest to full draw. Measured in inches. 4.9.8.5.2 The minimum firing distance for crossbows is 15 feet, 4.6 meters. 4.9.8.6 A draw stop is required and must effectively stop an arrow from being drawn more than 28 inches, 71.12 centimeters. It should protrude at least one-fourth of an inch 6.44 millimeters away from the arrow shaft. 4.9.8.6.1 If the base of the head of an arrow prevents the archer from drawing beyond 28 inches, 71.12 centimeters, the head of the arrow acts as the draw stop. 4.9.8.7 Arrow slash bolt striking surfaces may not easily pass more than one half inch, 1.27 centimeters, through a two and one half inch, 6.35 centimeter diameter hull. No part of the arrow slash bolt striking surface may be less than two and one half inches, 6.35 centimeters in any direction. 4.9.8.8 All arrows slash bolts must contain a penny or solid metal blunt of an equivalent gauge and circumference perpendicularly secured at the end of the shaft. 4.9.8.8.1 All arrows slash bolts 
using modular technology, must create a semi-permanent connection point through the means of threaded screws, epoxy, glue, or strapping tape. The head must be secondarily secured at the end of the shaft with tape. 4.9.8.8.2 All arrows slash bolts that are altered in any way during a day of combat will be treated as new arrows slash bolts and must be rechecked as such before being put back into use. 4.9.8.9 The arrows slash bolts striking surface must be constructed of open cell foam. 4.9.8.10 All arrows slash bolts must have at least two full fletchings. 4.9.8.11 The striking surface of an arrow slash bolt must be free of tape. 4.9.8.12 The arrowhead should not have excess axial or lateral movement and must be secured at the end of the shaft in such a way that they will not come off if firmly twisted or firmly pulled. 4.9.9 Class 5 coreless weapons have a minimum diameter of 4 inches, 10.16 centimeters, and are constructed entirely of foam, cloth, and or tape. 4.10 Prohibited weapons 4.10.1 Entangling weapons, for example, Nets and lassos. 4.10.2 Unmanned weapons, for example, traps. 4.10.3 Non-compliant double-ended weapons, for example, nunchucks, double-ended daggers, and pommel spikes. 4.10.4 Punching weapons, including punching daggers and tonfas. 4.10.5 any weapon that, when used as intended, violates the rules stipulated in the Book of War, or grants an excessive advantage. 4.11. Shields. 4.11.1. Shields must be padded on the edges and face, so as not to cause injury when struck with a forceful blow of an arm or hand. 4.11.2. The maximum width of a shield is 3 feet, 91.44 centimeters. Concave slash curved shields will be measured along the curve of the face. 4.11.3 The maximum height of a shield is 18 inches, 45.72 centimeters less than the height of the wielder. 4.11.4 The minimum dimension on the face of a shield is 12 inches, 30.48 centimeters. 4.11.5 Shield spikes are allowed for decoration, but may not form any rigid protrusions. 4.11.6 Shields must be reasonably rigid, which is defined as the edges not bending towards each other excessively when attempting to bend the shield in half. 4.12 Armor checking. 4.12.1 Definitions 4.12.1.1 Composite Armor of metal, leather, or both that is attached to another material backing and or covering. 4.12.1.2 Cops Rigid knee and elbow armor. 4.12.1.3 Gauntlet Armor for the hands 4.12.1.4 Gorget Armor specifically for the neck 4.12.1.5 Helmet Armor for the head and neck 4.12.1.6 Leather Armor constructed of tanned animal hide Synthetic leather, pleather, or vinyl, and other man-made materials cannot be used in place of actual animal hide 4.12.1.7 Metal Armor constructed of metal includes chain and plate. 4.12.1.7.1 Rigid metal Armor constructed of discrete or continuous metal plates. 4.12.1.7.2 Chain or mail 
Metal armor constructed of interlocking metal rings. 4.12.1.8 Penny round. Armor checking standard, where the edge of rigid metal in armor is compared to that of a penny. 4.12.1.8.1 The edge of rigid metal armor shall have the smoothness of the edge of a penny. 4.12.1.8.2 the edge of rigid metal armor shall have less cutting ability than the edge of a penny. 4.12.1.8.3 The radius of any rigid metal corner must be greater than the radius of a penny. 4.12.1.9 Sabaton Armor for the foot. 4.12.2 Armor must be inspected for safety by the marshals. 4.12.3 Armor must not catch appendages such as fingers. This includes articulated plates and large diameter chain. 4.12.4 Armor may not have rigid protrusions that rise more than one half inch, 1.27 centimeters, from the surface. 4.12.5 Leather armor. 4.12.5.1 the minimum thickness for leather armor is 3 16th inch, or 4.76 millimeters. 4.12.5.2 The minimum thickness requirement can be achieved by layering up to two pieces of thinner leather. 4.12.6 Metal armor 4.12.6.1 Metal armor must be made from period materials and alloys, such as iron, bronze, brass, or copper. Modern steel alloys are also allowed. 4.12.6.2 Metal armor must conform to both of the following. 4.12.6.2.1 Must not be easily deformable by hand or by weapon strikes. 4.12.6.2.2 using a material with a thickness of at least 20 gauge. 4.12.6.3 Rigid metal must conform to the penny round standard. 4.12.7 Composite armor 4.12.7.1 Composite armor is defined as armor made up of leather, metal, or both, that is attached to, and or covered by, another material such as thin leather or cloth. 4.12.7.2 Studded, scaled, or brigandine armor can only be counted as armor if two-thirds of the armor piece is constructed from armor-grade metal or leather. The studs, slash rings, slash plates, must be no more than one-half inch 1.27 1.27 centimeters apart in all directions. Rings and washers also cannot have openings larger than one half inch, 1.27 centimeter. 4.12.7.3 Composite armor must be readily identifiable as armor by appearance. 4.12.8 Prohibited armor. 4.12.8.1 Rigid metal knee or elbow armor. Cops. 4.12.8.2 Rigid metal full helmet. Rigid metal full helmet is defined as being composed of large metal plates that are attached together in a fashion that the helmet acts as a solid object. Partial rigid metal helmets, as well as full helmets made of any other armor materials, are allowed. 4.12.8.3 Rigid Metal Hand Armor Part 5 Garb 5.1 Garb is defined as the clothing to be worn on the Balagarth battlefield. 5.2 Minimum garb is the basic requirements for all participants. Minimum garb is defined as 5.2.1 A tunic or tabard Covering the torso. 5.2.1.1 Neutral colored t-shirts with no visible printing may be worn underneath a tunic or tabard. 5.2.1.2 Wearing nothing on the torso is acceptable for men. 
5.2.1.3. Wearing a neutral colored sports bra with no visible logos or modern prints is acceptable for women. 5.2.2. Baggy pants or trousers covering the legs and the knees. 5.2.3. Skirts, kilts, and dresses are acceptable substitutes. 5.2.4. Footwear should be muted colors of a dark or natural color. Boots are preferred. Athletic shoes should be of a dark or natural color. Bare feet or sandals are acceptable. 5.3. Modern clothing should be disguised, modified, or otherwise blend in with and be unobtrusive to the medieval or generally accepted Belgarth aesthetic. Aesthetic. 5.4. Any piece of modern equipment or clothing required out of medical necessity overrules the minimum garb requirements. It should be covered when possible by clothing that does meet the minimum garb requirements, or the item should be superficially altered accordingly. 5.5. Forbidden items. 5.5.1. T-shirts that are brightly colored with visible logos, visible collars, and or visible pockets. 5.5.2. Camouflage, cargo pants, or modern shorts. 5.5.3. Modern jeans of any color. 5.5.4. Modern hats. 5.5.5. Any fabrics with modern prints. 5.5.6. Any realistic weapons. 5.5.7. Cleats and spikes. Appendix A. Weapon checking guide. Why do we check weapons? For the safety of all participants, since we are using weapons that are expected to be swung at full force. Standard. Ask yourself, would you feel comfortable getting hit by that weapon? Is there significant residual pain after the impact? Objective. To unbiasedly check all equipment for safety and rules adherence in an efficient and orderly manner without causing damage to the weapon. Things you must have. A. Copies of the Book of War. B. Templates. C. Scales. D. Tape measures. E. Volunteers. It could conceivably be done with one other person. E1. Red. Spears. Javelins. E2. Arrowbacks. Volunteers to have the arrows tested upon them. Wearing no armor. E3. Arrow shooters. F. Separation of past, failed, and unchecked. A2. General guidelines. 2A. Know the rules of weapon construction, preferably memorized. 2B. Don't destroy the weapons to check them. When checking for core, use the pads of the fingers or the palm of the hand, not the nails or the tips of the fingers. 2C. Treat every weapon the same. Don't be biased because you know whose weapon it is. If you feel you can't be objective, ask someone else to check it. 2D. Don't be afraid to get a second opinion. A3. Class 1. 3A. Start at pommel. Check for stability and no core felt. 3B. Using the pads of the fingers and thumb, go all the way up the flats checking for sweet spots and excessive twist. Excessive twist is when the foam spins around the core and does not return back to its original position. This indicates that the foam has separated from the core. 3C. At top, check for stability of tip and that the core tip cannot be felt. Also, check to make sure the cover is in good repair and that the foam is not exposed. 3D. 
Go down edges checking for sweet spots. 3A. Flex, wait, template if needed. The weapon may not flex more than 45 degrees. It must weigh at least 12 ounces, 340.2 grams, if it is over 24 inches, 60.96 centimeters in length, and must pass the template rules. Flex is tested by swinging the weapon against a shield or perpendicular padded surface at the topmost point of the handle of the weapon. A second person can estimate flex. 3F. Single edge differentiation. 12 inch, 30.48 centimeters, contrasting tape or fabric on the non-striking side of the weapon. 3G. Hit against leg. If not sure, check against back. Light medium, and hard swings. Some weapons feel worse at light and medium, or the same regardless of force. 3H. Stab test weapon one-handed on your thigh or another person's back. Stab light, medium with one hand, and the other stabilizing the weapon. Hard strikes must be checked with both hands on the weapon. Double check to make sure tip does not deflect and returns to its original position. A stab tip must not fold over excessively when tested at the hard level. 3i. If a weapon built for class 1 and class 3 use passes for class 1 but fails for class 3 use, the green tape can be removed and the weapon can still be used as a class 1. 4. Class 2. 4a. All checks for class 1. 4a1. Minimum weight 24 ounces. 680.4 grams. 4A2. Minimum length, 48 inches. 121.92 centimeters. 4B. Must be check swung and stabbed, if green, against back. 4C. Single edge differentiation. 12 inches, 30.48 centimeters, contrasting tape or fabric. 4D. Flex. 4A. If a weapon built for class 2 and class 3 use passes for class 2 but fails for class 3 use, the green tape can be removed and the weapon can still be used as a class 2. 4F. Rotate your testers. After a while, all class 2s will start to feel bad. 5. Javelins. 5A. Must have a yellow cover. 5B. Between 4, 1.22 meters, and 7 feet, 2.13 meters long. 5C. No more than 16 ounces, 453.6 grams. 5D. Less than 90 degrees flex. 5E. Must pass as a two-handed spear. 5F. Head stability. 5G. No exposed core on haft slash sweet spots. 5H. Throw test at minimum distance. 6. Class 3. 6A. No weight minimum if class 3 only. 6B. Max unexposed two-third handle. 6C. No yellow cover. 6D. Flex and template as needed. 7. Flails. 7A. The head of the flail must measure 15 inches, 38.1 centimeter, along two narrowest different axes. 7B. One hinge per flail. 7C. Chain 6 inches, 15.24 centimeters, max length. 7D. No more than 1.5 inches, 3.81 centimeters, of exposed rope slash bag. 7A. Courtesy padding. 7F. Put handle between legs and pull on flail head and hold tape measure or gauge parallel to flail chain. Check that chain does not stretch past 6 inches or 15.24 centimeter. 8. Armor. 8A. Must be worn to be checked. 8B. Penny round. 8C. No protrusions more than one half inch, 1.27 centimeter. 8D. At least 
20 gauge metal. 8E. Not easily deformable. 8F. Not catch the fingers. 8G. Leather at least 3 16th inch, 4.76 millimeter thick. No more than two layers. 8H. Check for no more than one half inch, 1.27 centimeters, gap between studs or washers. 8I. Washer openings no larger than one half inch, 1.27 centimeter. 9. Shields. 9A. Punch shields. A1. No hard protrusions at the top and bottom of the shield. A2. Handle securely glued. A3. No hand felt through front. A4. Shield should not bow excessively when attempting to bring opposite edges together. 9B. Strap and or cord shield. B1. Bolts safe. B2. Foam stable and attached. Pay special attention to where the edge of the core is attached to the foam. B3. Karate chop edge all around perimeter to ensure no core is felt. B4. Punch the front surface of the shield with your fist to check for core. B5. Shield should not bow excessively when attempting to bring opposite edges together. 10. Rocks. 10A. 4 inches, 10.16 centimeters diameter. 10B. Foam, cloth, and tape only. 11. Bows. 11A. Must be strung before bringing two weapons check. Don't string their bows for them. 11B. No cracks or excessive warping of limbs. 11C. No excessive protrusions like stabilizers or arrow rests. 11D. Draw testing. Techniques if you have problems with arrow falling off string when draw testing. 11E. Use same arrow for all bows. 11F. Crossbows will be hit tested at 10 feet, 3.05 meters. 12. Arrows. 12A, 2.5 inch, 6.35 centimeter template. 12B, two full fletchings. 12C, stable head, no wobble. 12D, check for no metal or tape under open cell. 12A, shaft not cracked, bent, or split. 12F, knock not broken. 12J, Draw stop at 28 inches, 71.12 centimeter, and minimum depth of quarter inch, 6.44 meter, from arrow shaft. The draw stop must actually prevent the arrow from being drawn past it. 12H. Check that a modular arrowhead is firmly attached to the shaft and cannot twist out. 12I. Check for any shifting sounds or clicking that may indicate that the foam is separating from the blunt. 12J, hit testing at 15 feet, 4.57 centimeter. 12J1, use a bow that is 35 pounds, 15.88 kilograms, or as close to 35 pounds, 15.88 kilograms as possible. Testing back cannot see the arrows. Hand covers back of neck, other covers kidneys. Thumbs up for a good arrow, thumbs down for a bad arrow. Arrows fail for hit if there is significant residual pain for at least 10 seconds after impact. Another measure is if the arrow back would tolerate getting shot in the head with the arrow. 12J2. If an arrow fails on one back, it goes to retest with other back. If it fails a second time, then the arrow fails. 12K. Rotate your arrow backs. Getting shot by a lot of arrows in the same spots eventually makes all the arrows feel bad. 12K1. Watch for excessive bounce back. Excessive bounce back is defined as the arrow hitting the back and bouncing either to or past the shooter. Questionable arrows should be retested against a different back. Failing that, 
It should be checked against a flat-faced shield. C. Crossbow quick reference chart. Just kidding, go look it up. When you find the crossbow quick reference chart, here's how you can use it. 1. Measure the power stroke of the crossbow as defined in Book of War 4.9.8.1.5. 2. Find the power stroke in the chart. 3. The poundage of the crossbow with that power stroke cannot exceed the acceptable max poundage. We hope you did not enjoy this annoyingly long list of rules. This has been your narrator, Kudzu, on behalf of the War Council of Belgarth and the Book of War, and you follow the rules, you're stupid. Shut up. I hate you. This work is copyleft, 2002 through 2017. Belgarth Medieval Combat Society and Greg Larson. Revision by Matthew R.J. Anderson. Permission is granted to copy, distribute, and or modify this document under the terms of the GNU Free Documentation License version 1.1 or any later version published by the Free Software Foundation with no invariant sections, with no front cover text, and with no back cover text. A copy of the GNU FDL can be found at http colon backslash backslash www.gnu.org backslash copyleft backslash fdl point dot html. Last revision as of this reading, April 6th, 2017.